Hello everybody and welcome back to Chess Diagnostic. Today I'm going to start the first of a multi-part series on my approach to openings. And I shockingly haven't really made any courses on openings. I've made some videos here and there kind of talking about general principles. Um, but I'm really going to get into kind of some lines that I play. And I'm going to do it from both sides because my own approach is to just play simple classical openings. And I really don't know that many lines, uh, but I'm going to show you what I do know. So let's get into Sicilian con trickery today. I'm going to cover it from black, and then I'm going to cover from white what I play. And it took me a while to figure out uh, what to play because I made a lot of mistakes. And that's the first lesson is that you really shouldn't try to memorize specific lines because what will happen is you'll get a position you'll try to rely on memory instead of understanding, and that's a big mistake. Your lines that you play should always follow your chess understanding, and they should seem logical and simple to you. All right, with that out of the way, let's get into specifics. So as black, I like to play Sicilian Con, uh, which starts with e4, c5, knight to f3, and then you could play e6. And what we're really wanting to learn for openings is patterns. So, of course, this is a very typical Sicilian position. And now, with a6, we enter the Sicilian defense con variation, b41. Now, there's a lot of different ways that white and black can play, and that's another thing that you need to take into account with openings. If you try to memorize everything, you're going to forget, and, you know, 27, 2600s, 2700s that are playing a lot of theoretical openings... The reason they can do that is because they already have the tactical and positional skills to handle basically any middle game. So, of course, your primary focus should be to learn the patterns, as many patterns as you can, um, and as many tactical and positional patterns. Because then, really, you'll kind of intuitively figure out where you should place your pieces in the opening. And that's the whole thing. All right, so after knight to f3, or knight to c3, you'll see this a lot in the con variation. Now, the typical idea is to play queen to c7. You want to place pressure on c3 as well as prevent e5. And that's very typical patterns in the Sicilian con, is white will try to maybe play f4. Uh, if you don't play d6, then he'll try to chase the f6 knight away with e5. So these simple patterns is kind of determining the line that you play. Now, this is actually a trick that... Uh, this this game, well, this is just the line that I'm showing, but this is the exact line that actually got me to an 1800 rating. Um, I was playing, I think, a 1900 player, and he actually went for this exact line, and I've seen it many times in Blitz games as well. So white just plays simple developing moves uh, with bishop to e3, and now you play bishop to b4, obviously threatening to just take the knight and win a pawn check. And so the queen moves, because a lot of times white will say, I've already moved the bishop, I'll just move the queen, and I'll castle queenside. Knight to f6. As you can see, all these moves are simple and logical, just developing as well as attacking. Now he's attacking e4, because it's pinned. And so uh, you'll see this all the time, actually, if you play the con, uh, especially at lower levels. So bishop to d3. Now, it looks very simple and logical, and you can see actually a lot of strong players. Um, maybe not top players, but of course, you know, 2,300, 2,500 players are getting into these situations. Now, what you want to play here is d5. Putting one more attacker on e4. And the reason this is a trick is because if white plays f3, now you have the sudden hit of e5. Suddenly attacking a piece and threatening a fork on d4. Now, if white goes for uh, knight to f5, which is an even bigger blunder, uh, blunders follow blunders, you would just take it, and then you would fork on d4. As you can see, it's uh, minus 6 for black, and it's completely winning. Although it's not so simple, I would say. Um, let's just go a little a little deeper. Now, he could play these kind of lines uh, if he just completely falls apart, tries to attack the bishop, and then you just take and hit the queen anyway. Now, if he takes, you win the queen, and if he takes on b, or b to c3, then you just take and pin the queen. If he moves the queen, then you get a discovery, and you get a new queen. 
So white can very quickly fall apart. Now, the best move, even though he's already blundered, is to just take on here. He takes d5. Now you take, take that pawn in the center. And now it's somewhat messy, but you do have an extra piece after these moves. You just, hopefully you can develop uh, by castling queenside. But otherwise, black is completely fine, and he has a one position. Although white has the two bishops in the center, um, I've had this position multiple times against even 2200 bullet players. All right, so let's just review this line. Uh, and, you know, this kind of restores my faith sometimes in opening lines is that if you know a specific knowledge, you know, you can win. But the reason, the only reason I remember this is because I've made the same mistake myself as white. Um, and then you kind of learn that way. So there's actually a book called Rapid Chess Improvement. And in the book, they recommend a one move a game opening uh, study program, which sounds kind of funny. But what you do is if you play any game and you study it, you just want to find one move deeper that you made a mistake. So I would recommend if you're under 2200, uh, to just use that or even if you're above you know you should you should focus on getting more tactical knowledge more tactical skills and more positional understanding rather than trying to memorize openings um, but of course it does help to learn some opening knowledge as you can see here all right so we'll just go through this line really quickly again with a6 all right and then you see this trap here d5 and then e5 all right so let me show a quick game here that actually I played against, uh, this was, what, less than, an, less than a day ago, against a woman international master. Her rating's not so high, um, but her, her fide is actually 2200. So um, this is a perfect example of what you'll get as black in the Sicilian con if your opponent doesn't necessarily make mistakes or go to, uh, go to any complications. All right, so... As you can see, this is a completely different line, but I just keep making the same moves. And white goes for fianchettoing the bishop and keeping everything closed. So again, you can see that your opponent can do a lot of things from the Sicilian variation, especially the con. But it's a rather classical opening because now everything's closed and black actually doesn't really have any problems. He can just develop. All right, so now uh, e5 is threatened and then... He could have he could have pushed it. Uh, eventually, I ended up playing e5 myself, kind of locking the center. And now we see more wing play. And this is where kind of, you know, the opening... Actually, let me go to the analysis board. Now, of course, this is a bullet game, but you could see that uh, from the evaluation, the opening, okay, white has a little advantage, but then I just slowly start outplaying black uh, based on just a better understanding. All right, so I just move my rook and now white kind of launches an incorrect attack and I just start defending maybe not the best defense but keeping my pieces over on the king side where white is trying to attack all right so would opening knowledge I would say it necessarily help with this situation not really it's more it's more using your own analysis once you reach the middle game now, let's say I memorized a line and I knew exactly what to play. Of course, when you get these kind of situations, when your opponent doesn't do what you're expecting them to do, then you're going to have to rely on your own brain. So actually, it's better to just rely on your own brain from move one. But of course, if you do know a line, then you should still kind of, you know, follow your own intuition. Maybe you develop the knight first um, instead of, you know, as the theory says or whatever. All right, so let's just finish out this game. I end up winning the queen, and I, I guess I could have taken the bishop there with my instead of attacking the rook. All right, so eventually everything just kind of falls apart. I end up pinning the rook, and then just a time scramble, and the game's over. Okay, so let's go to some grandmaster games, and now I'm going to flip over to the white side. So here is a game that was played between Aronia and Caruana two years ago. And it took me a long time to actually find this line because I was actually playing uh, the white side of the Sicilian con with kind of uh, knight to c3 and then trying to protect the knight on c3. 
And I learned once I learned this pattern, I've actually played quite a few games and have had really no problems as white. So it starts with e4, c5, knight to c3, and again, uh, as I was talking about. So Aronian doesn't necessarily play, he just kind of uh, reaches the position without necessarily relying on any specific line. Maybe there's a, a deeper reason. But anyway, we end up with this position. So Caruana's trying to go for the Sicilian Khan and put pressure on c3. Now the move here as white that I would recommend is g3. I really like this move, um, and it makes tons of sense in this position because black wants to play b5 eventually, and you would really like your bishop to be here putting pressure on a8 uh, to h1. So that's what we see here, and this is the important pattern to know in this position. All right, so the knight develops, bishop to g2, and now if black brings out the bishop to b4 to put pressure on c3, what should you do? Well, you should just ignore it. You just castle, and the reason for that is because, as in this game, bishop takes, pawn takes. Now, black just gave away his dark square bishop. You have a dark square bishop, and if black actually takes his pawn on c3, then there's going to be a lot of problems for him. And I really love these kind of positions. You can see it's a plus one advantage for white already. All right, so black actually, after trading that bishop, uh, you really kind of want to keep your dark square bishop in the Sicilian con because you do move uh, to a6 and e6, leaving the dark squares uh, somewhat weak. So let's see how Aronian plays it. Again, this is the typical patterns that you kind of want to learn in these openings. Now, let's let's just go real quick and see. Uh, let's say queen takes c3. What, what would you play? You could play uh, e5. As I talked about, that's a very typical pattern for white. Pushing e5, you kind of want to prevent that. And now if you just take here, you could actually play knight to f5. And even if he takes this rook, then his act black's activity is so low. After check, you actually win the queen. There's just tons of attacking possibilities. I mean, just look at this. These dark squares are so unbelievably weak. If he castles, then you can just bring your queen in. Threatening mate in one, he takes. And then you just, you basically own, you could, you know, even play just bishop to d6, and these pieces are not developing anytime soon. Uh, so a lot of problems. A lot of problems for black if he does that. And actually, I would say I played as black in this type of position. This is how. This is why I know how to play as white, um, because I made a lot of mistakes. I played as black uh, this way in the World Open, and I lost a game against a 2000 player because of that. So you're going to learn a lot of lessons. Uh, by making a lot of mistakes, and then you just kind of remember it that way, because pain pain is the best motivator, I guess. Pain is the best teacher. All right, so let's see how this game goes. This is actually a very crushing loss um, by Aronian, or a very crushing win by Aronian, a uh, loss for Caruana. Now, again, e5, a very typical pattern, and because the bishop's on a3, he wins the uh, rook. All right, so Aronian is just attacking all kinds of uh, queenside pieces, and of course that's because the bishop is being kettoed. All right, we just see more attacking possibilities. We'll just finish out this game. And that's another thing, too, is you can just look through games quickly and kind of find the main idea. Um, I, I don't really go for trying to memorize a specific line, um, so after bishop takes and rook takes, it's a simple tactic, and the game was over in 21 moves. Now, these are the kind of games I love to see uh, as in your preferred line, because if if you can see the main ideas and you just start playing them, and your opponent's not 2800 Caruana, then they're going to play even weaker moves, and you'll win in similar fashion. All right, so let's look at one more game as on the white side, and this is Morozovic. Uh, again, you're going to play lines and you're going to get many different positions in the middle game from those lines. And so you shouldn't try to memorize everything. You should try to understand the main ideas and the patterns. So let's see here. So we see the same opening. And when you go through multiple games, you kind of learn these overall patterns and the lines become less important. And you kind of just learn them by osmosis, I guess you would say. All right. So we see the same fianchetto. And now Peter Svidler uh, decides not to play bishop to b4, 
Um, and Morozovich just castles, and he really has no resistance. All right, so this is another pattern. You can see that now Morozovich is teaching us how to play when black plays a little more correctly, and he gets this kind of hedgehog structure. And so what should you do? You, sh you could just play b3. Now, seeing these kind of moves in Master Games is kind of really how I learn from Master Games, um, because when I see that, and then I kind of have a similar position saying, okay, my opponent's not really playing so aggressively on c3, um, what should I do now? And obviously, you just develop, and he plays knight to a4. So these kind of patterns are very important now. The purpose of knight to a4 is to play c4. And now that kind of hinders black's queenside development, and he's kind of stuck in the center. All right, so we see a couple more moves here. Everybody just completing their development. He brings the knight back. And now he switches to the king side. All right, some weakening moves, and now f5. So a king side attack wins the pawn, it looks like. All right, so look at that. Knight's coming to d5, and that weak backward uh, d6 pawn. That's just beautiful. All right, so... You can just see these typical patterns in this kind of opening, and it's different from the game where Ronin Crush Caruana, but it's also similar in that he's just trying to develop his pieces, and you just stick that in your head when you play these kind of lines. Now, what I would recommend is not necessarily setting up a position, but just try to go for the lines in a blitz game and try to play, you know, maybe 10 or 20 blitz games in a line, and once you have that, then you can go through maybe five of those games and look at it with a computer and see where you deviated. Um, now, the purpose is not to just memorize the next move from where you left theory, but it's also to learn where you deviated from the pattern in the middle game. All right, so let's just finish this game out. He won the queen, although uh, this is actually kind of a funny game because uh, white has an advantage, but it's quite actually quite hard to break through because uh, the rook and the bishop kind of create a fortress. And... At the end, when Peter Svidler resigned here, it actually, um, queen to h7 was a blunder, and he resigned, and he must have thought that this a pawn's getting through, but actually it's equal. So uh, try not to resign when your opponent blunders and makes it equal. All right, so hopefully these games uh, taught you something. Uh, I just covered some basic knowledge and a trick in the Sicilian con. And actually, I think I'll go through one more game as black just to drive the point home. All right, so this is a game uh, that I actually wanted to just drive one last point home to not be so hung up on a line or on a specific name of an opening. Um, what you want to do is you want to learn the patterns. And of course, in a game, especially against stronger players, uh, you're going to have positions where your opponent doesn't really go for what you expected them to go for. And this, this game is a perfect example. This game is against a grandmaster in a blitz game. So it starts with e4, c5, and I'm just trying to go for my well-known opening uh, against this player. And of course, he is actually playing, and see, this is how I learned how to play as white, because I played games like this, and you just see, okay, I had a lot of problems <laughs> as black in that game, and if I'm white and my opponent makes the same moves, that's the moves I'm going to make. All right, so I just try to go for that, and we're actually in the Sicilian defense French variation. Instead of B41, it's B40, and I just kind of try to stick with my typical ideas. All right, so I played D6, trying to prevent E5, and now I'm very cramped, and it's a little, it's rather uncomfortable, although I do have a very solid structure, and the evaluation is not so bad, although I start to play passively now. All right, so now I, I know that I should have played knight to E5, uh, but I did a move back, and this is kind of a psych psychological thing where in chess, when you're being attacked, sometimes you just kind of want to hang on and hopefully things work out, but you really need to always play actively. Easier said than done. All right, so I did knight to d8, reactivate the knight. Now I have this weak pawn on d6, which luckily he attacks it, and I can trade it, um, but now he gets tons of activity. All right, so again, a move back. Um, I should have just brought the rook in. All right, so I take that knight. All right, so I, I play b5, uh, preventing him from taking on b7. Now he takes, and actually that 
that activates my uh, f8 rook. And I, after he attacks the pawn, I combine attack and defense with queen to b6. He plays rook to c2 to defend it. And now, again, so this is another educational moment. When your opponent's attacking, uh, you always want to contest the piece that's attacking on your side of the board. And because the bishop is a long-range piece, even if it's on b2, you should always keep an eye out for that. And of course, it also sets up the idea to take this knight uh, just in case. So he brings the rook in. Now he's going to try to put pressure on e6. And now I actually played rook to d5 um, with a sinister threat that he missed all of a sudden. All right, so let's see what happens. So he plays h5, missing my threat. And now a sudden blunder. I take. He takes with the bishop. And now I take with the rook. So after he takes, I get this check. And it's going to be a mate and six. So a sudden blunder from an advantageous position. All right, so again, I'm just driving home the point that, you know, even if you're playing against a grandmaster, and maybe it's a blitz game, but it still it still counts. Um, that your tactical still your tactical skills and trickery should be focused not on memorizing a tricky line, but they should be focused on trying to create simple threats in middle game and end game positions. Because other than just being blown out of the board in an opening, which actually very rarely happens to me now at this point, and that's largely not because I've learned lines, but because I know to always follow religiously um, the three main tasks in the opening which is to develop your pieces castle and connect the rooks and if you really follow those then you'll be able to play any opening i would say all right so this is the first part of my multi-part opening series leave a comment below subscribe and let me know if you enjoyed this and i'll see you in the future <laughs>